All right, so we've just uh, done the bonus quiz, which was a review of the old material. Um, I wanted to draw your attention to this figure. Anybody remember the name of this diagram? Moody diagram, yeah. Um, most of you weren't here the day that I talked about the Moody diagram, and I'd encourage you to go back and review the recording if you haven't already, because it's important information. We've also done some uh, material relating to how to draw grade lines. And um, that's also important. And then there was a table that we looked at that has K values for a lot of different fittings. We're going to do an example in class today where you get some experience working with K values and friction losses in the same problem. So, um, you know, we have our exam this week. Our final exam is this week, believe it or not. That's not the right slide. Let's see. Well. Here's the right slide. Let's look at some announcements. All right, so you have homework due on Tuesday. One of the problems, problem 77, you, you shouldn't just say yes or no or whatever. You should actually answer it and then give some supporting rationale, like what's your reasoning that you chose uh, your response. So we're the 8 o'clock section. That means your exam is on Thursday at 8 a.m. It's, it's, so, it's coming so fast. The end of the semester is going to be here before we know it. It's here, I guess we could say. Um, so, regarding the final exam, um, I wanted to show you the course policies and how much it counts for your, uh, for your grade. It's 20% of the grade, the same as the other exams have been, and uh, I try and always grade the exams as quick as I can, so I may actually have that finished on Thursday itself. So you could know your final course grade for the entire semester by Thursday afternoon. Uh, here is the grading scale that's going to be used. And you'll notice here where it says 82.99, for example. So if you have 82.98, um, you know, you earn the grades, and if it's not into the threshold, you won't get the, the higher grade. And it's, uh, that's just sort of the way that I've always done it. I've never given a higher grade to a student because they came and asked me for it, and I'm not going to start. So. Uh, I don't know if that'll put more pressure on you for the exam or, or what, but I just want to let you know that uh, if you want to come look at your exam after I've graded it, I'm happy to show it to you, but if it's one of those appointments where you just tell me that your parents will beat you up or that you're going to lose a scholarship or something, then you know, I don't need to know that information because the grades are just based on this with one asterisk, and that is uh, at the beginning of the semester, I made a mistake on the syllabus where I had this alternate weighting scheme. So I'll calculate your grade two ways, and whichever way gives you the higher score is how you'll uh, get your final grade. And I don't expect it to be very different. Uh, for instance, here it's saying that lab reports are worth 10%. Here it's saying lab reports are worth 12%. But uh, I will put that into the grade book. You'll see the, this is the normal way of having the grading. Your final weighted average is calculated according to this on the automatic system, but then I'll have alternate average as one of the columns. And it'll probably be very, very close. But when you see that alternate average, it's related to this weighting system that I forgot to update on the syllabus, but I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt just in case it helps anyone. So any questions related to grades? Uh, like let's, if you get 79.99, then you still get the C plus. But if you get 79.999, then maybe I'd give you the B minus. Yeah. But actually, uh, I don't think that'll come up. That's a very improbable. I'm sorry you can't come back in after you've left the classroom. I'm really sorry you'll have to stay out until the class is over. You can take your things, though. Yeah. All right. So today we're going to be working through uh, this example. And um, we're going to be looking at a situation where there's a reservoir and we know the water surface elevation of the reservoir. Here you can see is a loss related to water entering a uh, pipe that extends into the reservoir. The K value for that is 1. And you remember that K values are related to local losses. And the way that we handle those local losses is we add up all of the K values for the entire system and multiply it by the velocity head. Now, if you have velocities, different velocities in the network, then you shouldn't multiply the k value by the wrong velocity. 
you should multiply if if you know the velocity through any questions okay you should multiply the k value by the velocity at the location where it occurs and so in this example the pipe diameter is the same everywhere it's a 500 millimeter pipe diameter and so we're going to be able to add up all of the k values to calculate the uh, the local losses um, here in part a it's asking us if we know the flow rate 580 liters per second, then um, we also know the diameter. From that you can calculate the, the velocity and uh, know what are the local losses and also know what are the friction losses. So H sub L has two components. H sub L has the local losses H naught and the pipe friction losses H sub F. So you should take the length of the pipe that's given in the problem statement you should take the velocity that you know using the continuity relationship Q divided by A, the diameter of the pipe is given, and so all of the information that you need is uh, available to calculate the losses. So to calculate the pump head, you're putting in all of the information between two points to try and find out how much pump head is required to get the water to do what it says in the problem statement. And in the problem statement, it's, it's telling you the flow rate. And you can notice that there is a difference in elevation between location 1, which is at the water surface of the tank, and location 2, which is at where the jet comes out of the end of the pipeline. Uh, here it says that it's 2 kilometers. And so you need to change that to 2,000 meters to substitute it into this equation, this Darcy Wiesbach equation, assumes that the length is in terms of meters. All right. So I'd like you to cal uh, calculate through and find out the pump head required, part A. And once you have that, we'll talk about some of the other steps here. We've already done the uh, pump head equation. For part B, you maybe remember that we can calculate power as the flow rate, the unit weight of the water, and H sub P. And that will give you the power required in watts. But here, it's saying that it's 58% efficient, so that there's some losses through the pump. The pump is probably heating up. That's the most common loss, is the loss due to heating. And so you're actually going to need more power than is said in this, uh, this assuming perfect efficiency. So what you have to do is you have to divide by the efficiency factor. So, You've got all the information you need for part A and B. Let me uh, bring the lights back up and pause the recording, and we'll see if we can figure this one out. Well, they're putting in a new screen right in the time for when we're not going to need it anymore, right? Like last week of the semester. Anyways. Um, so our stages here are, first of all, information will be given to you in the wrong form most of the time. So what I mean by that is when you're on the job working as a professional, people will give you the flow rate in liters per second. Or maybe they'll give it to you in cubic feet per second or something. So you're going to need to convert it into the form that you need it to solve the problem. So here we, that means putting the flow rate into cubic meters per second, the length into meters, the diameter into meters, and so on. Uh, the pump head, I've just rearranged the energy equation here in the first step knowing that I'm canceling out the pressure head at one and two because those are where the water is touching the atmosphere. So the, the pressure of the water will be equal to atmospheric. The velocity head at one is canceled out because the water at the top of a tank is essentially motionless. At two, I didn't cancel it out though because the water is still moving. It still has its velocity head at location two. So that's why here the velocity head term isn't canceled out at location two. There's no turbine in the system, so I uh, cancel that one out. Uh, the preliminary calculations, just sort of the easy, low-hanging fruit that you should always do when you see a problem like this is calculate the cross-sectional area for the pipe based on the diameter, 
calculate the velocity based on the given flow rate and the cross-sectional area. So with those two things under our belt, we can start substituting in, first of all, for the pipe friction. So here's an F value that's just given to us directly, rather than having uh, to look it up off of the Moody diagram. Pipe length, velocity squared, D2G. So uh, you can see that the friction losses are big. 33.8 meters of friction losses compared to the local losses. Remember, sometimes local losses are called minor losses. And you can see why they have that name. It's because the friction losses are 33 meters compared to the uh, local losses are relatively minor. They're 0.8 meters of losses due to these couple of pipe bends and fittings that we have uh, in the system. So if we substitute everything together, uh, you can see that here's the elevation difference between the two points. The pump definitely has to add at least that much head, the head required to lift, to physically lift the water. But then it also has to add enough head to overcome the losses and enough head for the, uh, the velocity head at two. Velocity heads are relatively small. You can see it's only 0.44 meters of head due to the, the velocity. The majority of the energy that has to be added by the pump is to lift the water, the elevation difference, and the friction losses. So all together, we have the uh, 50.4 meters of pump head, and then you can see for the efficiency factor, that works out to about 495 kilowatts. Good point. Yeah, I did. So here the K is 1, here's another 0.4, and 0.4. So all of the K values together are 1.8. And that was my process here because uh, the diameter was constant for the whole system. So at every location it had the same velocity. But if this was a different diameter pipe than the rest of the section, I'd need to know what is the velocity here and multiply it by that K value. And if these two had a different velocity than the entry pipe, then I'd have to sort of do it in pieces and in steps rather than all at once. Yeah. Are there other questions for these uh, first two parts, calculating the pump head and then using that to, to get the power? Okay, part C is a little tricky. It's saying we've just done the energy equation between 1 and 2, where 1 was the reservoir and 2 was this jet. We have to repeat the same process again because in part C it's saying, what about this building that's on top of a hill? Now buildings on top of a hill are sort of at risk in a system because they may have really low pressure. If they're high on the hill, then that means that actually a lot of energy in the water is being exchanged into increased elevation. So there won't be as much pressure in the pipeline high on a hill than in the low sections of the network. So it's asking us, if we know the elevation of the top of the building, it's asking us to find the water pressure. And so we're going to apply the energy equation again between two locations. You can either do it from the reservoir to the top of the building, or you can do it, and so the reservoir would be one, and the top of the building would be two. Or you can make the top of the building be location one, and then have this section of the outflow be location two, because, um, you know, we, we essentially just need to solve the energy equation where we know information, where we, uh, where we know the, ca the conditions at two points. So um, I did it between the reservoir and the top of the building. You can do either one and you'll get the same thing. But what we're trying to solve for is P1, we're trying to find P1 at the top of that building. So if you start with this being location one, then you again have to account for losses both due to pipe friction and due to um, uh, the local losses. The local losses will be the same since you still have these same three locations and the water velocity is the same. But the pipe friction losses are going to be different because it's 1.1 kilometers downstream instead of the full two kilometers. So we're not going to have all of the energy losses. And so you'll need to calculate H sub F again same velocity, same diameter, but the length is only one, uh, 1,100 meters instead of 2,000 meters. All right, so go through that process and see if you can calculate what is the pressure at the top of the building. One other hint is that 
we assume stagnation, that there's no velocity head. The water in the pipes at the top of the building assume that it's in the faucet, but the, uh, the water isn't turned on. So V2, location 2 is going to be the top of the building. V2 is 0. And see what is the pressure. OK, so what if you did this as your location? Then you need to know the velocity here, the pressure. Yep, you already know it. Yep. And so you would use, instead of 1,100 meters of length, you would use 900 meters of length. Yeah. All right. We've just got a couple minutes. Maybe uh, since it's already 1147, we won't have time to do those calculations. Let me show you uh, how I did it. We're running low of time because of the quiz. So here's what I did. As I said, um, location one is the tank. Location two is the top of the building. So I'm canceling out the pressure head at one and the velocity head at one. And then the reason why I calculated, I canceled out the velocity head at two is because I'm assuming stagnation inside the pipe network at the top of the building. The water is not moving in the pipe until we turn it on. Uh, there's no turbine in the system. So I previously calculated the pump head. So I already know that H sub P from the previous step that we did. So from part A, I know the H sub P. And the H sub F is different because it's only 1,100 meters instead of the full 2,000. So I'm just rearranging that, putting it into the uh, energy equation that I've rearranged for the pressure at 2. And it turns out the pressure is very low here. This 56 kilopascals is lower than the regulations say that is safe. Um, a typical low pressure would be around um, maybe uh, like 140 kilopascals would be a minimum pressure. So this is uh, too low to account for um, like there may be backflow coming in from the situation. All right, so in conclusion, we have a, uh, an assignment due when we get together on Tuesday, and then a uh, final exam on Thursday. So I'll see you in class next time.